Well, thank you. Um, I just to told Eric before he left that I hope we're getting another year like 2016 because that was an awesome year for cover crops. That was one of my best. Um, yeah, so my name is Katja Kulo Cole. Um, I'm the statewide soil health extension educator. I've been in this position since the spring of 2022, so it will be two years uh, this March. Um, I, I do a lot of work with cover crops um, and have been doing that for for about, uh, well, I started in 2015 to work with cover crops in the agronomy department. I was a researcher there before I, I came to extension. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the former panel this morning, um, and I hope uh, I hope that you guys can can maybe learn something. I sure learned a lot from uh, from you guys, and uh, um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to exchanging some ideas and and some experiences. So um, yeah, so my my talk is titled "Can It Ever Be Too Cold to Plant Cereal Rye?" Um, and the whole you know, the whole reason that I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that is maybe not so much with the people in this room, but with a lot, lot of other folks that I'm talking to, you know, especially those that haven't planted cover crops yet, um, they often have very high expectations for cover crops. And sometimes, you know, we have to kind of, I think, take a step back and really think about the biology of those plants and kind of think um, to, to really, you know, I guess, lower our expectations, I probably shouldn't it that way, but shouldn't phrase it that way, but just have a little bit more realistic expectations. So with a lot of our cover crops, and, and uh, Aaron and, and the others talked about it this morning, you know, it's, it's hard to get it um, planted on time. So Ciora rye is kind of our savior when it comes to that, because it is a very cold, hardy plant. Um, but let's take it, a step back and just for a second, you know, remember biology and what we all learned at one point in time, you know, every plant has a minimum temperature that it needs to grow. Then there's sort of an optimum where it really flourishes. And then there's the maximum temperature. Um, and so, you know, the later we go in the year to plant something, the more we're going to force these plants to operate right here, right? So can we really expect like super awesome growth rates, you know, and we know we need a good growth rates to get all these functions that we want from our cover crop. Um, so I think that's just kind of what, something to keep in mind. So um, yeah, don't force your cover crop to be a survival artist. On the other hand, what I always say, you know, it's all about your goals. So anyway, so. Um, I started out talking about zero, right? But I wanted to also show some of the other winter cover crops. And my talk is gonna be mostly about cover crops that we're planting in a corn soybean rotation. So after harvest of corn or soybean and terminating in the spring, we are experimenting actually a lot with summer cover crops, but they're not really, I don't have any slides about them, but you can certainly, we can certainly talk about that afterwards. So here are just some of these winter or fall planted cover crops. So cereal rye, um, it's amazing, right? I mean, minimum temperature for germination is only 33 degrees. I mean, you know, it basically germinates when it's, you know, when water is freezing, which is just a hard thing to really wrap your mind around. And the winter hardiness is minus 30, and I think some people probably go even lower than that. So it is a, a really, really tough plant. Um, in comparison, winter wheat needs a little bit higher minimum temperature and is a little bit less winter hardy. And I think that's uh, something we have seen in, in uh, especially last year, probably with some of our winter wheat. Um, oats, another popular fall cover crop, 35%, uh, so 35 degrees. Now only went hardy to 20 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, Fahrenheit. So um, barley, um, where I'm from in Germany, we grow a lot of winter barley and it, it does fantastic. Um, but here we can't really, we rarely get it to overwinter at a, at a, you know, at a good enough, at a good enough amount that it would really be worth our time. Although some people, we have, we have some people that are breeding winter barley in Nebraska. So, um, I'm including some legumes and brassicas uh, here as well because I know they're often included in uh, fall planted uh, uh, cover crop mixes. So. 
Hairy vetch is a great crop, it's a great legume, um, but it really needs higher temperatures for germination. It is very winter hardy, actually. Um, so it, most of you who've grown it probably will know that, but it just needs to be planted at a time, you know, where it has, um, what has those minimum uh, temperatures for germination, and then it needs a lot more growing decrease in the, in the fall, yeah. Um, I think so. Um, it has a lot of the hard seed, so I would say yes, but even then, if you've grown it before, it's, it's a rather slow growing crop initially, so depending on how long it takes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it's kind of similar with the brassicas. They're often included, and a lot of people like the brassicas a lot for grazing, but um, and we, we can certainly discuss that, you know, again, it, it all comes down to personal goals, but, um, you know, they can germinate at those temperatures, but they're not very cold hardy. Canola actually is a lot more cold hardy than uh, radish. However, um, you know, brassicas, if, if, if we want something that overwinters, the brassicas, we, we've planted canola in some years and it, it occasionally overwinters, but usually less than half of the stand will, and it's gonna have to be a warm winter. Um, I think one of the things, you know, again, in Germany where I'm from, we always grow winter canola and it, our windows are not as harsh, but we also get a lot of snow. Usually there's snow cover, it, there's more soil moisture, and the plants are uh, planted in August usually, the crops usually planted in August, so it has that reset stage. So. Again, you know, usually the, the, uh, um, the, the larger the plants are, the better their chance for, you know, surviving the winter, so. But um, for the brassicas, I, I typically, again, would say, just like with hairy veg, if you're planting that, if you want it to overwinter and have a good stand in the spring, I would plant it by late August or early September, probably. Um, and again, I know, I know a lot of people plant it and they, they hope to get some fall grazing. And you may, you, you may be happy with what you're seeing, but just know that you know, um, there's gonna be very little growth in the fall if you're planting it late and then it, it usually tends to freeze out. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the cover crop trials that we've been doing. So we started uh, a, a larger statewide project in 2015, and it actually ended in 2022, just last year, but I, I have here, I should move that over, but that should say 2015 to 2018. So four years of data um, from Mead. Um, we, tested, we tested cereal rye, we tested two different mixes that were cereal rye with um, some brassicas, and the hairy vetch was in there as well. And then we planted either a broadcasting where we went in at this time of the year, sorry. We went in, in about early to mid-September and broadcast. Um, or in some of the plots we drilled after harvest, which was about you know, mid-October and sometimes not until mid-November. So, and then we had two different termination dates. Um, one of them was usually around the middle of April and one of them was about two weeks later. So, um, you know, again, I'm trying to think about, okay, what, what, you know, are we giving those plants the, the growing decree days and the precipitation that they really need? So it was kind of interesting just listening to Eric's talk because I remembered several of those years because I look at the weather data for a long time. But um, so 2014, 2015, I have the weather data for all those years. The only really warm and wet year was 2016. We had an excellent cover crop stand. Um, the other years, 2017 wasn't bad and 2015 was okay. 2018, do you guys remember that spring? It was super cold and dry for a long time, so we had like this much growth on our cover crops. But again, you know, what I'm saying here is, you know, Nebraska is very variable, as we all know, in weather. And so, um, especially for those cover crops that we're kind of planting 
in the marginal tolerance, um, it, it can be pretty difficult to get a good stance and good productivity. Um, the average biomass in those cover crop trials was about 1,000 pounds per acre, and that's four years, three sites, four or five different treatments, and we planted it in corn and soybean, we planted it in soybean corn, we planted it in continuous corn, we planted it every year. So it's about 1,000 pounds per acre is the dry matter that we had in the spring, and that, that's what that looks like. So um, it was cool to see some of you guys' pictures. You definitely are going for a much more cover crop biomass, and as I understand it's for weed suppression and things like that. Um, we, we didn't do that in, in these trials. We just, it was sort of like an introductory trial. We wanted to test it out. Um, but I think for a lot of people, if not, if not the majority of people that grow cover crops in Nebraska, that's probably kind of what it looks like in the spring in most years. So um, it's not a lot, but it is something. Um, you know, the other things, especially when we're starting to uh, trying to understand how cover crops influence the, the next crop. You know, residue, how much residue is left? Does it cover my crown? What does it do to the, to the soil temperatures and to soil evaporation? And what else did I have? Yeah, and that was a picture in, in um, yeah, soil moisture. So what I, okay, let me see where, yeah, so, starting to uh, think a little bit more about how much moisture those cover crops need and also use. Um, for those same trials that I just talked about, we actually measured soil moisture. We used neutron probes, which are very accurate, but you kind of have to read by hand, and I think we got five or six readings per year. So the soil moisture readings in these trials showed basically no difference in soil moisture between the cover crops and the check plots. Um, in some ways, that's probably not surprising since we had rather low cover crop biomass in many of the years. Um, and we also we measured throughout the crop growing season, so following the cover crops. In one year, we had a significant difference, but that was just one inch of soil water. So it was lower where we had a cover crop, but just one inch. Um, but that was really the only uh, meaningful difference that we found. So, um, so I know, and, and, and I'm talking about this because it was also something that, that John wanted me to touch on because a lot of people that first start out with cover crops are kind of concerned about the water use. Um, you know, they're concerned about their following crop, but from our trials, we, we could never really tell that, um, that the, it, there would be too much water being taken up by a cover crop. Um, one thing I also wanted to touch on is how much water does a cover crop need? Again, we're often planting it during pretty dry times. So we know germination is a critical time, especially when we are broadcasting the cover crop, and that's what some of us are doing. So one of the um, graphs that we came up here, and I apologize, this is actually in millimeters, but this would be an inch right here, 25 millimeters or an inch. So we uh, you know, measured at different times. Um, we, we looked at the rainfall, the cover crops, the broadcast cover crops had gotten, and made like a little response curve here. Um, and what we found, and we knew that from the literature from other um, studies that had been done, that it was really important to get that rainfall within the first seven days after broadcasting, but we really wanted to know, okay, how much rainfall do we need? And since we had so many sites, it was kind of, it was, it was a good opportunity to make a response curve like that. Um, and what we found is, you know, it was just right around the optimum germination, so we counted how many plants emerged, I should say, uh, optimum emergence was right around that, you know, about an inch, a little bit less than an inch. So, you know, it's a good number to remember if the cover crop a broadcast cover crop needs about an inch within a week of, of broadcasting. Um, why not more? Less, obviously, that was pretty clear. Less rainfall leads to a much lower emergence. But more, you know, also led to, to lower emergence. And I, I think, 
and you guys can can throw in your ideas too, but my guess is if you get a lot of rain on a broadcast cover crop, it probably kind of gets washed away or runs off. So this was kind of some of the thoughts that I had, but um, yeah. So, um, so since we didn't really have <laughs> good numbers uh, to, to use for, for how much water a cover crop takes up, um, I wanted to show you this here. This is a ET table, and you can actually find it um, on our CropWatch website. And I'm gonna try to find it here, actually. Let me see, I'll try to pull it up. Uh, anyways, I'll pull it up later, sorry. <laughs> or or can, I, can I just type that in here on my, if I, yes. remember if I had it in my presentation or not, if I had a link in there, but yeah. Yeah, so I'm, as I'm pulling up this table, it's a little bit slow today. Um, how many of you work with CropWatch or check our CropWatch site occasionally for resources? Okay, cool. So you may be familiar with this then, but... Um, So here's the site. Um, we, we have a weekly newsletter during the growing season. Um, and we also put a lot of materials and resources up here. So if you go to weather, you can find uh, growing degree and evapotranspiration data. I think this is where I found it. Nope, that's actually not where I found it. I'm gonna go through and find it. So, and you can find ET maps for different plant growth stages. And all the way down here, we have winter wheat. We have corn too, soybeans, all kinds of things, including winter wheat. So that is basically just that same table, but I wanted to pull it up um, just to kind of show you. So, um, and I've just been talking with Nathan and he said that he also uses that occasionally just as an estimate. If you have your cover crop, your cereal rye cover crop, and you're concerned about soil moisture, some of you are not, um, you can kind of use that table to figure out, you know, approximately how much soil moisture, or, or how much, yeah, how much moisture the rye uses. So if I'm reading this right, and again, um, and this is, if, um, those are the, the, um, the growth stages of the rye, and then up here is the weekly ET, if you have one of these ET gauges, rapid transpiration changes. So as we can see here, well, it's actually really hard to see. Let me see if I can. Okay, maybe now. Oops, no. Um, so if you look at your crop stage, they're down here. So for most of our cover crops, they're gonna be at tillering in the fall, and then in the spring, they're, they're moving into stem elongation, basically. But a lot of times, not everybody, but for most people, they are probably going to terminate their cover crop somewhere here in this area, first node or when stem elongation just is starting. Um, and when you look at this down here, so again, this is the, um, the ET, change in ET, um, we can actually see that the cover crops during that time use a fairly low amount of water. Um, and then I think the other thing to remember too, so they, first they don't need a lot of water because they're still so small. And then secondly, you know, again, we're in spring, usually early spring, March and April. It's not very hot outside yet. Uh, um, the, the, it's often kind of cloudy, so I think we have less of an ev evaporative demand. Um, so that too, I think, kind of contributes to the fact that we often don't see a, a lot of water being taken up by the cover crop. But of course, it do, uses some, right? I mean, all plants do. So, that that kind of makes sense? 
Nathan, what do you think about, would you think that's a realistic assumption or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's kind of a you know if you want to check for yourself what how much water your crop takes up potentially, that's a good way to do it. Um, goals, again, what, what you want your cover crop to do kind of determines everything, you know, determines how you should manage it. So um, I, I've looked through the literature, I've worked with cover crops a lot, you know, and there's a, a bunch of numbers floating around. What, how much cover crop grows, how much above ground biomass do you really need for some of these functions? And it was interesting to listen to you earlier today because you're doing some weed control, you're trying to get some weed control on the cover crop, and weed control is one of the ones where you really need a lot more cover crop. 4,000 pounds, some people say even more than that. Some people think you can get away with a little bit less than that, but that, you know, you want a tall, dense stand for weed control. However, you know, I think we had a stand like that in those trials that I just talked about maybe one year, and that was 2016 when it really looked like that. Um, a lot of times it looks like this, you know, this is, would be in the fall, you know, then in the spring you tend to, a lot of times, especially with the broadcast cover crops, you kind of tend to get those, you know, thinner stands. Um, I think it's better than nothing. I think it helps with erosion. Um, we know that you know, some numbers in the literature for erosion control say, yeah, a thousand pounds, it's really all that you need to, to help with erosion, wind erosion, water erosion, and reducing nitrate loss, which is also important. Um, some of the other tests that I do, I do a lot of soil microbial and soil health tests. I have seen with really low biomass, which is probably even less than this, I still have seen increases in microbial, especially bacteria, and even some fungi numbers. So. Um, you're getting a benefit, but it's probably not that big benefit that you're hoping for. But then again, if, you, oh, if you're going into weed control, um, there's something very, you know, you, you need that big stand, you need a lot of cover crop biomass. Um, you probably have to manage that a little bit better, plant it a little bit sooner, have a higher seeding rate. Um, so you're going to invest a little bit more, but you can probably save yourself some money on, on buying herbicides. And then um, just lastly, I wanted to mention a few of the, of the other projects that are going on, um, you know, looking at cover crops. So because we are often so late in the season, you know, the high boy inner seeding or broadcast inner seeding has, has become uh, a much more interesting thing for a lot of people to at least try to, to uh, um, try it out. So Katie Pekarik, um, she is a water quality extension educator, has been leading the uh, high boy cover crop inner seeding project. Um, it's in its second year this fall. I think this fall they planted 30 farms. I know last year it was, I think it was 29 farms last year and over 3,000 acres. So um, it's a cool project. Um, and then, um, we, we actually went in last year and counted some of the uh, emergence of the cover crop. So some of, those, some of those fields were irrigated, some of them were dry land. So we wanted to see, okay, planting with that high boy, you know, broadcasting, are we getting, are we getting a good enough emergent that is actually, that it's worth it, you know. Um, so we planted rye at 70 pounds per acre. The rye was all irrigated, and I think most people irrigated about half an inch or maybe up to an inch um, after it was planted. 
And so we got you know, 20 to 60% of the seed emerged. So that's kind of what it looked like. I think that's a good enough stand for CRRI. Um, it's not as high as it could be with drilling, but you're planting this earlier than you could with drilling. What we know about CRRI is it is a really a crop that tillers a lot. So if, it, if it's planted early on the fall, it has more time to tiller. And so it can make up for the, the lower seeding rate by just tillering and it will probably uh, produce a, a good stand. Um, then we looked at some of the mixes. The mix that was planted was 60% rye, or 60 pounds rye, seven pounds turnip, and three pounds rapeseed. Um, we had some irrigate, we had some dryland. Yeah, the dryland was really low in emergence. Um, a little bit better in the irrigated. This is what your brassicas looked like in the fall, and that was right before the first freeze. So to me, that's another reason why I would say, you know, it's probably better than not having anything growing there, but I probably wouldn't include it. I would probably just go with the CRRI because, you know, it will, it will kill after the, it will die after the first freeze, so. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of all that I had for today. Um, I started out with asking if it's ever really too cold to plant zero rye, probably not, but even rye needs a few growing degree days, and especially when we start to think about, you know, other things that we want that rye to do. So again, you know, choosing planting times or crops that you can work with that allow your, your cover crops to be planted earlier so that they can get a little bit more of that rainfall and get more of those growing degree days. And then, you know, with the hairy veg and the brassicas, we can plant them. I think they are great, you know, they're, I, and I'm, I love to see more diversity with cover crops, but we have to remember those are, are plants that need, they need more growing decree days, so we need to plant them a little bit earlier than that. And then, that's kind of all that I had for my talk. I think I wanted to share some resources. Oh yeah, that's actually the crop watch site. We already looked at it, so I don't need to go through it again. Um, but yeah, uh, so I'm making a little bit of, um, I'm advertising some of our upcoming events. So we have two soil health conferences coming up this spring. Those are the same soil health conferences that some of you may have attended at uh, the Eastern Nebraska Research uh, and Extension Center up at Mead. This year we have one in West Point, removing locations a little bit, um, trying to cover more of the state. So February 29th in West Point, and then uh, March 5th in Hastings, it's a similar program. Um, so you can attend either one of those. They're gonna be no cost to attend. Of course, they include a lunch, and yeah. Uh, I think that is all that I had. Um, yeah, and we can, we can talk a little bit more. You can also email or call, so yeah, thank you. Now let's give Katya a hand. <laughs> more red stuff. <laughs> I I kind of had a question that that relates maybe to Aaron and 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 what Katya talked about in the broadcast versus drilled. So you've got your new your new machine that you're sort of drilling with this year, and you're part of the High Boy program. Do you have any thoughts this year on the differences between those two on your case? Uh, can you tell emergence flies this year? I boy was earlier, so it had some time to emerge. You drilled your others after harvest. Do you have any opinions yet? Uh, yeah, so... Uh I was lucky this year for the high boy. We were the only dry land uh, person that they accepted. Uh, they kind of did that on purpose. Um, for the last year, it wasn't very successful. Probably wasn't going to look very successful this year. They also coordinated with a rainfall event for the high boy for me. So we got, uh, it was like 2300s, um, two days after the high boy ran through. Um, if we wouldn't have got that, I don't think we would have had a successful year. Um, the previous year, uh, we actually kind of terminated, we, we didn't terminate it, we went in and planted rye over the top of it. The only thing that really survived in the fall was the rapeseed, and weirdly enough, the rapeseed also came back in the spring. 
uh, and the rye kind of came through, but it was like one percent. It was really pitiful. Um, yeah, I mean, being me being uh, dry land, it, rain is the kicker. If you got irrigated, you can do it all day long, and it's really easy to do. I, I think it's still too cold. I think it, it needs, I mean, you know, it could have sprouted, but I, I think it would just be a little, the little radical, you know, just a little root, but no leaves. I don't think it would at this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, yes. Good point. So the question was, the, the first question was, if we had a rye and it snowed on it, and uh, when we, pl we planted it, it snowed on it, and now we had a few warm days, would it, would it come up, basic? Would it, would it germinate? I think it probably would germinate. I don't think it would produce any leaves. What, what do you guys think? And then, and what, what it will do in the spring, and that's kind of an interesting thing that I observed, because we've had that situation several times, it will just basically, it basically won't tiller. It will just start with that stem elongation. So you'll have like one, you, you know, it's kind of an interesting looking plant, but yeah, it, it could produce some heads, yeah. One thing on the rye and wheat, yeah, spring tillers end up being productive heads or plants, spring tillers, um, is really dependent on genetics. So when I work with growers on winter wheat, we know certain varieties will produce more spring tillers and more of those spring tillers will produce a head where some varieties are not very good at that. So there's genetic differences in wheat. I would assume there would be some genetic differences in rye. I don't think those have been studied as much from the cover crop a standpoint because it just there hasn't been the yeah. research demand for that, but and that's why so variety would makes a difference on rye and wheat, but we don't always know all the information on the rye, on the different varieties. And then if you're VNS, you have no idea what you have, um, so that's a whole nother. All right, good discussion. Anything else for the good of the cause or? Aaron, it looks like, or Trent. <laughs> all right, well, one more round of applause for all the speakers. Thank you. Really appreciate everybody coming out and really good topics and good discussion. So I appreciate you all um, participating. Some of the uh, housekeeping. Um, I did pass around the mailing list forms. If you want to be on our email list or mailing list, you can fill those out and, and leave them leave them out there on the table. Um, there's also, we have CCA credits in progress. There's a sheet going around. If you need CCA credits, be sure to get your information on that. And thanks again to Tyler and Bayer for sponsoring us. And 
a reminder for the next session is January 4th, um, nitrogen management, nitrate issues. David Iqbal from UNL. Um, we have uh, Sentinel coming and um, Tim Mundor from CVA talking about their nitrogen program. So should be some interesting stuff. So thank you again for coming. Hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>